Hey everyone, this is Derek and this is section 9.2, inverse functions. And in order to define an inverse function, we'll need this idea of one-to-one, -one, so let me do that first. So a one-to-one -one function is a function in which each output value corresponds to exactly one input value. So that sounds probably a little familiar from our function definition, except it's backwards. So when we we're talking about is it a function, for that we said for each x there's only one y. And now for each y, there's also exactly only one x. Um, you might remember with functions, they had that vertical line test. So if we had something that looked like, say, a circle, a circle doesn't pass the vertical line test. Um, so that would not be a function. But a parabola does pass the vertical line test, so that would be. So for a function to be one-to-one, -one, it also has to pass a horizontal line test. So going this way. So if it hits it twice going this way, when we go to find its inverse, which is essentially going to reflect it about um, the origin, its inverse won't be a function. So that's why we need um, for our functions to be one-to-one -one for the inverse to exist. Uh, you'll see at the end of the section, we, we can also do things where we say, okay, so this isn't one-to-one, -one, but what if I only looked at this part of it? Okay, then I can make it so that an inverse exists. So we'll figure out how to limit the domain to do that. So for this first part, um, could the following tables represent ordered pair from a one-to-one -one function? So here, I can see I have duplicate y's. When x is negative 1, y is 1. So if it were here, x is negative 1, y is 1. And then when x is 1, y is 1. So that would not pass the horizontal line test. So we would say no. Um, here, it doesn't look like I have any duplicates in y. It just And it looks like it's increasing. Um, so we're going negative one third, one, three, nine. Uh, so we're getting some sort of increasing function. So I would say yes on that one. And then graphs are totally, is really easy because you just have to think horizontal line test. So parabola fails, so that's a no because I hit it twice. Um, and again, the reason is when we see what the inverse is, it's gonna have that graph kind of reflected this way. And so then its inverse ends up failing the, the horizontal line test or the vertical line test is not being a function. So that's why these are gonna to have to be one-to-one. -one. Um, this one passes the horizontal line test, so we'd say yes. Uh, absolute value, nope, it does not pass. And then same concept, except now with equations. And so with these, I would just say, look at the equation you're given and then think about what the graph looks like. So this is a linear equation with it happens to be a negative slope. So this would say yes, um, that is one to one. This one is quadratic, um, shifted down three, doesn't really matter, it's not one to one, so that's a no. Um, a root function would look, that would be shifted to the right, something like this, that does pass horizontal line tests, so we would say yes. Okay, so then moving on to um, the definition of an inverse function. Um, let f be a function. A function g is said to be the inverse of f if the domain of g is equal to the range of f and uh, for every x in the domain of f and every y in the domain of g. So the idea is they're going to have the exact same and opposite domains and ranges. Um, so the domain of the original is the range of the inverse and likewise the range of the original is the domain of the inverse. Um, and that's kind of what this is saying. It's saying if I put a value into f, let's say I put f of three and I got five, when I put that at five back into g, which is the inverse, it's gonna come back out three. So again, it's the x's and y's are swapping places. Uh, the notation, let me write that a little bit bigger, f inverse x. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll look at that and think of a negative exponent, and it is not anything to do with the negative exponent. It just reads f inverse x, which is this idea. It's the function that has the exact opposite domain range is the one we're looking at. Um, and then to verify if two functions are inverse to, to one another, um, what you do is the composition, which is what we just did in the last section. So if we do f of g of x, and then we do g of f of x, and both times it comes out to just plain x, then those two functions are inverse to one another. So let me show you what all that will look like with um, some actual problems. So this first one is just asking us to basically verify that these two are inverse. Um, so it's asking us to find the composite f of g, and so that means um, all the x's in f are going to get g in this first round. 
So this would be three, instead of X, it'll be three, G goes in there. Um, here I can cancel those threes, so I'm left with uh, X minus four plus four, and then those cancel out, so there's our first X. Again, that's what it should do if it's the inverses come right back to itself. And then here, uh, same idea, but now we're putting F into G instead of G and F. So this would be 3x plus 4 minus 4 over 3, plus 4 minus 4 cancels, leaving 3x over 3. 3s cancel, leaving x. So since both of the composites come out to x, then that's an inverse. And that's what you'll put in, the, um, in this box on the homework is inverse. Okay, so next is finding the inverse uh, graphically. And our directions are graph the given function, so this thing and its inverse on the same set of axes. So let's just make a table for this one. We don't have to, but it'll help to explain the inverse. So when x is 0, y would be 0. And then since that's 3 fifths, I'm going to plug in a 5, because it makes for easy math. So then I can think of those 5's canceling, and then that would leave 3. So this is f of x. That's my original function. So for my inverse function, f inverse x, I can make a table, and now that I have this first one, I can just swap the ordered pair. So 0, 0 is still 0, 0, even when I swap them. And then here, 5, 3 would be 3, 5, because again, the inverse has the exact opposite domain and range. And then when I graph them, I should get this particular symmetry. So 0, 0, and x is 5, y is 3. So something about like that. And here, 0, 0, and then 3, 5. And so you notice if I folded my paper right along this diagonal, I should get a little fold line. I didn't do a very good job of it, but I should get a little line right here. And then it's the inverse, the function and its inverse are always going to be symmetrical about that line. And so if you draw your first graph and then your second graph doesn't look the same, something's wrong. So it always has to have that symmetry. And then one more of those, this time just from standard form. So for f of x, this is uh, negative 3x plus y equals negative 6xy. So I could bring the 3x over and do slope intercept, um, or I could do, um, I'll show both, or I could do uh, the x and y intercepts was my other thought. So if x is 0, y is negative 6, and if y is 0, uh, dividing that over, x would be 2. And then my inverse. So then I would just have negative 6, 0. And instead of 2, 0, I have 0, 2. So x is negative 6, 0, 0, 2 would be there. Something like that. And 0, negative 6, and then 2, 0. So something like that. And then again, we should see that symmetry right there. Um, the other way to do this is just to bring uh, the 3x over. And then I could do y is negative 6 and over 1, up 3, over 1, up 3. That gets me that same line. Okay, so to find the inverse of a function algebraically, um, first thing is if it's written as f of x, just call that y. So in this case, I'll just think of this as y equals negative 5x cubed plus 7. And the reason for that is the next step is we're going to swap x's and y's. And you'll be more comfortable solving for the y as a y rather than f of x or an f inverse x. So it's just for convenience. Um, so then we'll swap our x's and y's because remember that's what this is. The domain and range are swapped. So negative 5y cubed plus 7. And now we just have to resolve that for y, and then that's our inverse. So we will subtract our 7 over, divide both sides by negative 5, and then from there we'll just take, since this is raised to the third, we'll take a cube root. If that was raised to the seventh, we take a seventh root. We just undo powers with roots, and that's because they're inverse to one another. And so then that would be our inverse. Uh, 
this next one. So we'll go y equals 9 for x minus 1. We swap our x's and y's. So x equals 9 plus 4y minus 1. And then we just got to get y by itself. So we'll subtract the 9 over. And let's square both sides. And it looks like on the homework, I think they left that as a squared. And then we'll add the one over. And then we'll divide the four at the same time because I'm almost out of room. And so there's that. Okay, so this one is a little tricky and it's because there are two X's. So if I think of this as Y, then I'm gonna have x equals negative 2y plus 5 over 3y minus 7. So then which y are we solving for is the answer is both of them. Um, and so that's where people kind of get messed up. So the first thing we're going to do is get rid of the fraction because it just isn't better with fractions. And that will get that y up out of the denominator where you can get at it. So this is going to give us 3xy minus 7x. I'm just distributing. And this side, that's gone. So the negative 2y plus 5 is what's going to survive. Um, I am at this point, this is where you have to remind yourself what you're doing. And that is you're solving for y. I'll see, see people go right backwards and solve for x again and end up right back here. Um, so we want to get y's on one side and then everything not involving y to the other. So I'm going to add this 2y over, I'm going to add the 7x over. So now this is 3xy plus 2y equals 7x plus 5. And then the trick right at this step is to just factor out the y and then it's, you're set. So then y equals, or sorry, y out front and then 3x plus 2 left behind. And once you have it written like that, you can see exactly what you're dividing by. And then there's your inverse function. Okay, and then these last couple, we're going to have to restrict the domain to make it one to one, and then we can find the inverse on that domain. So for number nine, we're given um, x plus four quantity squared. So just as a reminder, uh, plus four, so that would go left four. And so we have something that looks kind of like that. So that's the what I would be picturing in my mind as I kind of go into this next part. So find a domain on which f is one to one and non-decreasing. In otherwise, in other words, it's zero and increasing. And so if we look kind of right there at the vertex, everything from here over is either zero or getting bigger. Um, so my domain on this would be from negative four, and I'm including that because it's just saying non-decreasing, and at that point it's technically zero, so I want to include it. Negative four to infinity, and then find the inverse of the function restricted on this domain. And so now, if I when I do that, what I should get is something that uh, we don't have to graph it, but what I should get is something down here um, that's still a function that doesn't have that bottom half. So um, we'll go y equals x plus 4 squared, swap our x and y, x equals y plus 4 squared, uh, root both sides to get rid of the square, and then subtract over the 4. And so that's exactly what we saw is we got um, root x shifted down 4 units. And this last one's the same directions. So this one is I'm kind of thinking of the what the graph would look like. This would be down shifted down six units, still x squared. So the domain in which this is one to one and non-decreasing, this time it's going to be zero to infinity. Again, I'm including the zero because at that point it's technically zero. Um, the slope is neither increasing or decreasing, and then going to infinity, um, so the slope is ever increasing there. 
And then, so this will be um, x equals y squared minus 6. So this time we want to get the 6 over before we do the root. I'm going to isolate the square. So x plus 6 equals y squared. And then root both sides. So square root x plus 6 equals y.